on his computer. More live on Facebook. I love Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <clears throat> Let's see here. Where do I want to post it? On a page I manage. Can you still hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Jess Montgomery. Next. I got some thumping music going on outside my window now. Oh, I cannot hear it. Good. <laughs> That's probably a delivery guy. Oh. Right. Too many of those packages happening. Okay. My little circle's spinning. Oh, uh, yeah. Are you having like Wi-Fi sharing issues in your house or not so much? Um, the Wi-Fi is a little wonky where I'm sitting right now, but, um, if it gets, if it get if I see the bandwidth get low, I'll, I'll move. Okay. We just have so many people doing like, you know, my son's on Zoom classes, my husband's on Zoom meetings. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's weird. All right. So we're going to go live in three, two, one. Oh. No out there in Facebook land. I think so. Yeah. I'm directing to Facebook Live. <laughs> Is that real life or digital? Okay. I believe we are live. Awesome. Hi. Hi. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm good. It's great to meet you. Thank you. Um, for those who are tuning in, this is my buddy, Mariah Fredericks, and she is an awesome author. I'm going to see if I can pull up the photo of her newest book, which is what we're going to be talking about. How's that looking? Death of an American Beauty. Very nice. Isn't it? It's such a beautiful cover. I haven't read it yet, I will confess, but um, totally fine. I, but I will. <laughs> I've read the other two. Um, and I want to know what happens next. And I'm giving away an ebook uh, to somebody who comments today or on the recorded um, version of this by noon tomorrow. Um, so an ebook of the first book in the series, A Death of No Importance. Um, so I think that's kind of exciting, but yeah. So uh, let's see, this is your third. I'm looking at my questions. <laughs> your third, Jane Prescott Mystery. Congratulations, it's always exciting to have a new book out. Um, can you give us a quick overview of the series? Um, for those who haven't had the pleasure of reading it yet, and about this um, title in particular. Sure. Um, well, the Jane Prescott mystery series takes place in 1910s New York, the years leading up to America's entry into World War I in 1917. Um, they started in 1910, 1911, um, and they follow the adventures, I guess you could say, of ladies maid Jane Prescott, who works for the hapless nouveau riche Benchley family. And it's that classic situation where the servant is smarter than the master. Um, <laughs> <laughs> working in the great houses of New York since she was 13, so she actually knows this milieu better than the hapless Benchley's, um, especially their oldest daughter, who's Louise, and very ill-suited to the sharky environment she now finds herself in. 
And that sort of explains why the Benchwees trust her to handle all sorts of problems in their lives, including murder. <laughs> we all need somebody to help us clean up a little murder here and there. Absolutely. Right? Come up here, get, clean up the body on the floor, yeah, or, you know. Please. Oh, I you know evidence. <laughs> Um, so the third book in the series, uh, uh, Death of an American Beauty, I decided to send Jane, give her a vacation, because she worked really hard in those first two books, um, and she's a young woman, I wanted her to have some fun, um, but I also wanted to explore the less gilded side of her life. Mm -hmm. um, she goes to stay with her uncle on the Lower East Side. Uh, he runs a refuge for women who are trying to leave the world's oldest profession by getting new training. <laughs> um, and it's the night of the big annual dance where the women can kind of stop improving themselves for a little while and just kick up their heels. Unfortunately, one of the women is found murdered, and Jane's uncle, who's kind of a cranky, difficult guy, um, falls under suspicion, so Jane has to spend her vacation finding the killer and clearing his name. Wow, so she'll need a vacation from her vacation. Exactly, poor woman. <laughs> poor thing, she finally gets a break, and it, again, it's back to figuring out the murder. <laughs> Louise pulls her into her shenanigans. It's, you know, a movie's made for ever done. And it sounds, it sounds like your other books, um, like you're, you're diving into social justice issues um, and themes. Yeah, yeah. Um, all the books, for each of the books, they take place year by year, and I try and choose a few key moments of each year. The first one was the Triangle Factory, which sort of highlighted the issues of exploitation and labor and the expendability of human life. Mm -hmm. um, and the second one it was, it took place right after the sinking of the Titanic, uh, when men heroically sacrificed themselves for the women and children. So that one was very focused on gender dynamics and also immigration, as so many of the people who died were immigrants coming to this country. And then with Death of an American Beauty, um, it's very much the plight of poor women and poor communities and what is policing like in those communities. Mm -hmm. But the other half of the book is Louise gets herself involved in a pageant to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. Wow. Society ladies at this time like to put on their big cultural events. Um, so <laughs> You get into, and the pageant is going to take place at this very fancy department store. So I wanted to look at the sort of a commodification of beauty, which is coming mm -hmm. more and more into mm -hmm. fashion. You know, people say, you should look like this, and you can only look like this if you can afford to look like this. Right. Um, so those are sort of the themes. Uh, and that's why the title of the book is American Beauty. I love it. Okay, that's great. And we have certainly echoes of that continue. Women are told all the time, you, you're, you're too thin, you're too fat, you're too tall, you're too short, you're whatever. Um, right. So it's really fascinating to explore uh, the roots. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We're letting all that go now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm kind of embracing this little gray streak, whatever. Um, but to explore Absolutely. those roots pardon the bad pun, um, of how that both sort of suppression and idealization started. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's very, there's a moment in the book where Jane enters the department store, it's called Rutherford's, and she feels seduced by the fantasy of, you know, sure. you could only buy this, and you could be that, and, mm -hmm. but it's not a benign fantasy. Um, and it, it can be cruel in its yeah. way. 
Absolutely. Um, and I, I too space my books one year apart and I've been fascinated by um, how much a difference a year makes, which we're all kind of experiencing now, but yeah, but, but you know, when you're going back in time, you know, you might think, mm, is there that much difference between 1926 and 27 in my case, or 1911 and 1912 in, in your case? And so were you surprised by that? To how much difference there might be in just one year? I usually thread things through Jane's personal experience. And I know if I had what her emotional arc is going to be. Mm -hmm. But I try, the, the overarching theme is the march towards violence and the slaughterhouse and sort of the breakdown of structures and that people are just trying to decide we have to fight each other in order to get where we feel we need to be. So you definitely start getting a sense as the years go on that there's more and more violence in the public hmm. space, you know, that there's, I mean, we start thinking of the Gilded Age as Edith Wharton and Henry James, this very genteel era, and in fact, you know, we lose two presidents to assassination, people try and kill Morgan, they try and kill Frick, numerous hmm. strikes are violently put down, um, you know, policing is fairly inept at this time. If you're murdered, it's, there's a good chance there's not going to be any real consequences um, or justice. Um, so it feels more like energy is building rather than that there's a, there's huge differences. I see. Um, yeah. Culturally, things are getting much more liberal. One of the things, you know, you're, you're seeing the shock waves for the coming youth revolution in the 1920s. You know, young people are already out there dancing to scandalous music. So um, the course is <laughs> on its way out. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, I'll, I'll just say to anybody who's watching, if you wanna post a few questions um, after we're done chatting, we'll see if anybody's posted questions and see if we can answer those. But I have plenty more questions, as you know. Um, because I'm curious about what inspired you to write about the Gilded Age in New York. I know you're in New York. I know you studied history um, in college, but but what drew you to this particular era of um, to write about? That's a really good question because God knows there are so many talented authors writing Gilded Age New York, like Victoria Thompson, Rosemary Simpson, Alyssa Maxwell. Mariah um, Fredericks. Mariah <laughs> um, I hear she's pretty good. <laughs> the books really started, I used to write young adult novels. Right. The books really started with the first two lines popped into my head, which were, I will tell it, and I will tell it badly. And I knew that the language was kind of formal. It didn't feel contemporary. I noticed that she immediately apologized mm -hmm. for her ability to tell the story. So this vision of somebody who wasn't heard all that often, having a secret that she just had to talk about at last. So I started thinking about a servant who would know the truth of a famous crime of the century. And in order to do that, I needed a time when servants were commonplace. Um, and you she had to be a lady's maid because I wanted her to have some access to the thoughts and feelings of her employers. Mm -hmm. And I needed a level of media that would create a crime of the century. Um, you know, something where it would be in the headlines and, you know, this narrative would be built up and that took me to the yellow journalism of the Gilded Age. Um, and there are so many parallels between now and then um, in terms of the divide, you know, the vast economic divides that we're seeing, the tensions between right. Native and immigrant men, women fighting for public space, 
Um, you know, it was a time when a lot of people thought it was a good idea to kill people. So that seemed like a terrific time to set a murder mystery series. So many motives. Um, yeah, and I'm just so fascinated that <clears throat> you heard a couple of lines stray through your imagination and you followed your imagination. I've been talking about that <clears throat> uh, with other people about, you know, I'm trying uh, during this pandemic while I'm have a little downtime um, to play with uh, ideas outside of um, my kinship books <clears throat> to kind of follow my imagination rather than tell my imagination where I want it to take me. Um, and it's just fascinating to me that you had two sentences and you know, what you really had was voice, that, that writerly thing we always talk about and try to define. And, and you had not only a voice in your head, but you had voice and you knew that voice had to be very particular. So I think that's really cool. I love that story. There was an article in The Guardian today saying that most novelists characters speak to them. And that's yeah. where it starts. And I, I think that that's true. Yeah. Uh, I do too. Um, yeah. And I love having imaginary friends. Right. As well as real friends. <laughs> yeah. but if you don't have the perspective, and I think that this is really important, A, with mysteries, but B, historical. If you don't know the eyes you're looking through, yeah. It's very hard to organize events. Exactly. Yeah. And to think about, you know, how much would my character know and how would, how would she find out this information? How would it come to her? And, you know, it wouldn't be immediate uh, like it is for us. You know, we can look things up um, on a whim. Um, our characters can't, you know. So it's interesting to think about that as an aspect of, um, a person's relationship with the world, really, and, and point of view, not just, you know, I will tell it and I will tell it badly, but um, our point of view about, you know, why are we here? And now I'm, now I'm diving into philosophy, but like, why are we here? And, and what is our relationship with the world? And, you know, what does our time on earth mean? And that can be defined very much, I think, by, you know, status and, and society and who you are and do you think about those elements i'm i know you do but how does that inform your um creation of your stories well i think i mean part of the big challenge when you i mean i work with an amateur detective you mm -hmm. you work with a professional sheriff um but part of the challenge with amateur is getting them to care enough to try and solve this mystery so for the first, for the first two books, the Benchley families were under, the first book, the Benchley family was under threat. So that was her compulsion to find the killer. And the second book, it was a young woman who was an immigrant but a servant like herself. So I think she felt enormous um, loyalty and felt like her death should matter like who killed her matters we can't just sweep this under the rug and then the in the third book her uncle's reputation was at stake but in the fourth book which i just finished jane doesn't really like the person who gets killed and she's not so interested <laughs> in finding out who killed her okay. and it's only because her boss is like we, we need to do this for various reasons that she gets involved. But yes, in each case, always the, the question in the first book, a death of no importance, the, val the, the, the way that the public views the value of the life lost is a question. Wow. And <clears throat> That's a great way to phrase it. I love that. Um, we have a gap. Yeah. yeah. Nice so, uh, so I know you're sheltering in place in New York, and as I am in Ohio, and our governor uh, just an hour ago was uh, sharing um, some of the changes that are coming as we slowly try to ease out a little bit. Like, um, oh, wow, yeah, but it's very gradual. It's um, medical procedures, like you can go to the dentist starting May fourth, I think it is, you know, that kind of thing. It's not, we're not, we're not starting with 
let's have you know a big party in the, in the middle of the, of a ball stadium or something you know we're not being um you're not southern california <laughs> <laughs> no beach well we do have beaches but you know i think we're pretty safe from people going to swarming the beaches of lake erie at this point uh -huh. here <laughs> So we're not starting with the beaches of Lake Erie. It is true. Um, so we're, we're seeing some uh, thoughtful and measured um, approaches to to try to. I mean, as my husband keeps saying, and he's absolutely right, we're all in uncharted territory, um, and so it's it's weird and confusing. So I'm curious. Um, you know, we've talked about how each of us have uh, just in our private conversations dealt with, you know, writing and juggling various aspects of life with this but how do you think how do you think jane i mean she hasn't she hasn't experienced the 1918 influenza pandemic just yet that's a few years in the future yeah. um but you know from her perspective what do you think i mean that's it's kind of a time warpy question but uh how would she what would she think of all this do you think well, it's funny, I was thinking about the fact that life was so much more vulnerable and fragile in her time and disease was much more uh, a fact, you know, just a, a, real, a, a, a dangerous threat at all times. Mm, true. Really. Right. Um, and, you know, in, in 1916, if I get to do that book, there was, uh, I think there was a milk problem where children were getting sick and dying and like all the, then as now, all the affluent families left the city. <laughs> so I have her leaving the city. Um, you know, her job is to keep things clean. So I think she would be keeping <laughs> these well stocked with soap and making sure everybody who touched her clothes were, um, yeah. appropriately sanitized. Um, I mean, as she would have understood that, but um, maybe keeping, she, she's a rule follower by and large. If she thinks that the rules are rational, then she will, she will follow them and safety is important to her. Her friend Anna the Anarchist, not so not much. So much. <laughs> he wouldn't be wearing a mask is what you're saying? <laughs> Anna, might, Anna would wear a mask, but she wouldn't cancel her labor meetings if, if I if I knew her. Um, so <laughs> that's um. interesting. Okay. Um so how are you staying connected with uh writer other writers? I know we've chatted on the phone and and via I think we did Skype once and we've done Zoom a couple times now. <laughs> so how are you connecting with other writers and, and, and how are you connecting with readers and are there events um, or blogs that you've written that you'd like people to know about so they can connect with you in that way? Oh, that's a nice question. Um, well, because the book just came out, I've been hearing from readers on a fairly regular basis. You know, I, I put a big message on my website saying, I am at home with just my family. I would love to hear from you. Please write to me. I don't even care if you have problems with the book. <laughs> you know, I never thought about putting that out like, help. And I have to say, like, every day I have some piece of mail. So that's nice. That is nice. I um, like it. <laughs> And I, I really have found that the mystery community is so, I mean, I connect with people on Facebook and on Twitter and, you know, Malice was supposed to start Friday. So all of us who are looking forward to seeing each other then, I think, are really reaching out. People are hugely aware of those of us who have books coming out during this time. And people, I mean, you've been incredibly supportive. I'm talking with you. Sujana Massey on Friday at five o'clock. Um, speaking of mysteries on May 4th at 11.30. Nice, that's a wonderful podcast. That's She's, I love Nancy, she yeah. is so great. Um, and Such insightful questions she always asks. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've done like, some, some articles for, you know Marshall Zeringues? Yes. Yes. I just gave my book the movie. Ooh. And that was fast. 
<laughs> what is for I cat my son once asked me, he said, Would do you think what Peter Nyongo could play Jane? And he, or he said, Would you want her to it? I said, if she wants to be in anything that I write, she is more than welcome. <laughs> it's okay, I'll accept that. <laughs> right. And I said, you know, I don't think that the books really would adequately honor the experience of a lady's maid in 1910s New York as played by Lupita Nyong'o, but she has that kind of openness and intelligence, but generosity that I do associate with Jane. Um, so either that or Carrie Mulligan, who was my other choice. But there you go. I find it really, really, when people ask me that question, I'm never sure what to say. You don't know who you would cast as Lily? No, I have no idea. I, I will confess that I am a huge Supernatural fan. Mm -hmm. uh, that is my guilty pleasure. Um, it's not much of a confession because I tell everybody. <laughs> and, and, and they're in their final season. And if I can just... If I can just, you know, be sad for a second, even though it's really silly. They were within two episodes of, of wrapping up their final season when they had to stop production. Oh, no. I know. So it was like, okay, I have so much to be grateful for, but I'm going to spend at least five minutes just being really bummed <laughs> that they were within two episodes. They'll get it done. Um, but the guy who... Um, um plays um sam is an actor named jared padalecki and i think he would make a great daniel or is he the know. goofy brother or like the older more mature one well he's the younger brother I, th that he's the tall with the darker hair brother okay so and so he's yeah um and then dean is the older brother Oh gosh, you shouldn't have gotten me started. Uh, who's um, more serious in some ways, but is also a very kind of goofy character as well. So anyway, um, I just kind of envision, yeah. I mean, I wasn't envisioning, I never envision actors or actresses or specific faces for my characters. Um, but when somebody asked me that, I thought I have no idea for Lily, but I think Daniel would be great played by, you know, Jared Padalecki. Yeah, I can, yeah. That would work. <laughs> you know, it's funny, like, like regionally she's not right, and I don't know if she's ever done anything not contemporary, but somebody like Lily Taylor hmm. strikes me as, like, she's got that will and that intelligence that I associate with Lily. Um, so. That would be fun. Oh, well, I'm going to ask one more question, um, and then uh, I think, you know, I, th I think after that, we'll probably just wrap up, unless you have something to add. Um, so one of the things uh, that I do as a, as a day job is I'm a columnist for the Dayton Daily, and I write a column called Literary Life, and so I interview a lot of authors, so that's one reason <laughs> I'm, you know, comfortable with this. Um, but one of the questions I al almost always ask uh, is, do you have three quick tips for people who um, maybe you're thinking about writing or who have been stalled in their writing and want to get started again? So three quick tips for writers that you would want to share. Okay, for, for writing, not, not anything to do with the publishing. Not, yeah, we're focused on craft. Okay. I mean, you could throw it in about publishing if you want. That's fine too. I think, I mean, I can only say what works for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that to start with, and I start with a world and a, and a set of characters that you're excited to get up and immerse yourself in every day. Like, I always think of it as, this is a slightly gross analogy and I apologize, <laughs> but you have to find like the vein that will really gush if you're just kind of, squeezing it out it's going to be total yeah. torture yeah um so no matter how non-market friendly it seems find what gives you pleasure because if it gives you pleasure it's going to give the reader pleasure um i would say 
I write every day and I write as little as possible every day. That's just me. Like <laughs> as little as possible? As little as possible. I can write more, but I'm allowed to get out of the chair if I write usually it's like one to two pages and then I add in rewrites. Um and in that way I have gotten 14 published books finished. Well it's worked, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's because otherwise I think you get the pressure gets too big and it becomes overwhelming mm -hmm. and uh and the third thing is don't wait till you're in the mood to write particularly if you're just starting or you're going back after a long stretch because it's going to be really rusty and probably what you write is going to be horrible and you just have to kind of knock off all the rust and really just get loose with it. It's like when you go back to exercise, like you're like, yeah. <laughs> um, so, and be kind to yourself. I mean, ha I mean truly have fun um, and finish. Do work towards yeah. finishing something yeah that's so. that's great advice i love it oh. anything you want to close out with about your wonderful book hold up your book again okay hold, hold up your third book and i'll hold up your first book oh. <laughs> here, here was the second book which they did such a it's so beautiful i feel so sad they did it. look at the spine that they did i don't know if you can see Aww. it but yeah. they like, carried around and now nobody can see it because it's not in stores um, you know, we should give a shout out to minotaur our our mutual publisher <laughs> speaking yeah. of their beautiful work thank you yeah. minotaur for producing thank such you. amazingly beautifully designed Absolutely. crafted books we Absolutely. love you we love you yeah. minotaur. <laughs> <laughs> um so no i mean i just i feel i feel really grateful that we have this creative endeavor that we get to indulge in during a very difficult time so yeah. um, and, and the mystery community rocks it does thank you to all of our readers you know yes we yes. appreciate you guys keep reading us keep reading other writers um it's it's a way to stay connected and yet at the same time escape <laughs> right and you know, mr readers are a great bunch too i was just saying this woman a lovely woman reached out to me and i she was just having such pleasure with the books and i was like do you know what it means that you took the time to express that to me like that's really kind and it's just, that is it's great um, right well i'm going to end our meeting uh, okay and uh, then hopefully save this recording <laughs> um, so that people who weren't able to join us uh, uh, at, at three can see this later on. And I'll talk to you soon. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>